Hey everybody, Joe here from Bad Advice for Good Times and this is our third vlog on the channel and today we are talking with Chad Pfeiffer and Chris Lackey from HP Podcraft. This is Lovecraft. All right, so you want to start? Yeah, let's do it. So, wait, 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 are you, are you trying to tell us what we're doing? <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to, um, so as you know, I started this uh, vlog called Lovecrafting, which uh, is celebrating the, uh, the people who, uh, creative people who bring the mythos to life. And um, obviously you guys are fundamental within the uh, Lovecraft community. So um, I like to think so. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've talked to a few people so far. I did a long thing with uh, Robert M. Price. Um, we did an introduction to ourselves as well because I don't know if you guys know, but we do all those little, those funny little Lovecraft inspired shorts. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. And I, we, you and I have been doing email things many times, and I, I think I've, I've shared my love of your your short films uh, with you. I hope so. But um, yeah, so I, uh, you know. The t time between production is is uh, long, so we started doing this vlog to kind of fill it up, and um, uh, also too to let people know about what else is going on with out there out there in the community. It's amazing how many people don't really know. Uh, I mean, we know a bunch of people who have very niche or very specific um, uh, points of reference. They didn't, even, you know. I know about. You know, ten people who didn't know about the, your guys' uh, podcast, and what? Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it's always nice to discover new people and discover new things, and so on and so forth. And um, that's kind of what we want to do in between our uh, in between our our shorts. We're going to do these little vlogs, and right. uh, we've been talking to um, some folks and. Uh, asking them how they got into Lovecraft, um, you know, why they keep doing it, uh, that sort of thing. And so I would love for you guys to, you know, introduce yourselves and um, talk about why HP Podcraft. Okay, okay, sure. Sound good? Yep, yeah. All right, let me know when you're officially ready to begin. This is it. I'm, this is, yeah, I'm here. This is my handsome face right here. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm here today with uh, Chad Pfeiffer and Chris Lackey from HP Podcraft, and uh, hi guys. Hello. How are you doing? Where is everybody? I'm, I'm in Los in, Angeles, uh, California. And I'm in Yorkshire, uh, England. Nice. And I'm in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The Great it White is. Multinational. Multi Expanding. Yes. Um, so, uh, maybe you guys can just tell me a little bit about yourselves and, uh, how you, how you, uh, started the podcast, why you started the podcast, um, start there. Sure. Uh, well, we started podcast in 2009. Uh, it was Chris's idea. He wanted to do a podcast because he was listening to a lot of them at the time and felt like it was something that we could do. And we had a basic knowledge of how to do recordings and that sort of thing and a deep well of music and um, on in terms of what the topic was we already knew from doing the 2005 uh, Call of Cthulhu silent film and just years of being in that community that it was a somewhat underserved community in terms of entertainment and uh, content out there right I mean that was basically what the motivation was yeah absolutely and um, we decided to do well we didn't have any you know we didn't know what our trajectory would be but we just knew that we wanted to cover one short story a week uh, which we started to do. It took us from 2009 to 2012 to cover all of Lovecraft's works. Um, each episode is a half hour long. We've got guest readers on. Um, sometimes we'll have an expert guest, like we've had S.T. Joshi and Robert M. Price, who you just said prior to this that you had on the show recently. Um, and that's, we, we got to the end of Lovecraft's work, and then we decided we wanted to keep it going. One thing about uh, Lovecraft was that he was a big supporter of other writers. He was a big admirer of uh, his influences and was very vocal about that. So we had a huge list of stories and authors that we could cover. So we moved on from Lovecraft himself in 2012 and started covering Arthur Mack and uh, Blackwood, you know, Poe. We've gotten into H.G. Wells. We've, we've, we've run the gamut of early 20th century weird fiction. Almost everybody we've covered is dead. We recently made an exception for Ted Klein, and we did the events at Porth Farm, but yeah, otherwise dead authors. 
and uh, we we kept it going strong. We're still enjoying ourselves. What are the uh, what are your parameters in terms of weird fiction? Like, how do you define, for instance, H.G. Wells? I wouldn't consider H.G. Wells in that category. So, how do you define it for yourselves? Well, generally, when we go through the the older stories, it's, it, we look at supernatural horror literature as kind of our uh, our touchstone, and it, we see what Lovecraft himself had to say about, about these particular stories. And uh, well, the the time machine is a story that I'm familiar with, and it has some very Lovecraftian elements to it. Plus, it's just a great book, and it's something that we wanted to cover, and it's something that we know uh, Lovecraft himself had read and liked. So uh, that's kind of where we go from, and then we also take a few recommendations from listeners. People say, hey, you got to read this story. This one's great. We'll check it out, and if it seems like it fits, then we do it. Why did you Yeah, we, I, oh, we've done, uh, we, the last couple of years, we've done Black History Month in February, and obviously there were no Lovecraft recommendations for uh, those works, but we, you know, <laughs> fans were able to say, hey, here's something that's actually really cool from around that era, uh, and so you know, we go outside of the of the Lovecraft box here and there as well. As long as it, our parameters are simply that it's got to be in that sci-fi or wheelhouse. Does it touch on the weird or perhaps, because with H.G. Wells, I think the first thing we did was uh, one of his underwater civilization stories. I can't remember yeah. what it was called. I forgot but what it was called. It's a submarine that just keeps <laughs> sinking and then pretty soon he sees there's all these cannons. This is a whole, you know, Atlantis under there. And it was definitely influential on Lovecraft's Shadow of Smith, et cetera. So some things might not be weird, but they definitely pushed the envelope or, developed an idea that he ran with later or that other weird fiction authors ran with. We also cover, you know, Robert Block and uh, uh, Clark Ashton Smith and other yeah. people who were in that Lovecraft circle that he wrote with. Why did you make the uh, exception for Porth Farm? That story in, uh, in particular, if you're not familiar with it, is about a guy yeah. who goes off into the woods to read weird fiction and basically cover a ton of stories that we'd already covered on the show. I mean, his mission is somewhat like what our podcast mission was, so right. it was pretty relevant to the work that we're doing. I mean, he goes out there with a huge case of weird fiction. And then within that, I mean, the story itself is a good piece of weird fiction. So it seemed appropriate. It was awesome. written in the 70s. Right. Yeah, that's a, it's a great story. He re, what is he, he references uh, Mackin, I believe, right? In the story. Mackin, Blackwood, Dracula, just a ton of stuff that we've either covered before or actually we're moving on to cover now. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, like, how did you guys... You, you mentioned you knew what the podcast was going to be about. It was going to be about Lovecraft. You thought it was an underserved community. How did the each of you get into it personally? Well, I started uh, with the uh, the um, Call of Cthulhu role playing game. It was uh, I never heard of Lovecraft before, but I was a big D and D guy. Played Marvel superheroes and all those role playing games uh, when I was like, you know, from I was ten years old. Uh, I think it was probably thirteen, maybe even fourteen, when my friend Jason Woodburn said, "Hey, you got to play this game." Call Cthulhu. It's based on this writing by this guy, P. Lovecraft. And I was like, what's that? And then I got one of the old, uh, you know, the, uh, I always forget it, the black and white with the red covers. You know, they're black and white, they got touches of red in them, that collection. Mm -hmm. The Doom that came to Sarnoth was the first, and other tales, that's yeah. the first book that I got. And, and then I just been a Lovecraft fan ever since. Yeah, Chris actually introduced me to the game. But prior to that, I had a, um, an uncle. In a in very Lovecrafty style, who like willed me a few books, a few boxes of books that he had from when he was a kid uh, in the '60s, and they were all Ed Grice Burroughs Tarzan books and um, like all great pulpy stuff, some Asimov, you know, all science fiction adventure. But there was a um, case of Charles Dexter Ward in there, so I read that when I was in junior high. Thought, well, that was pretty cool, but then put it on the stack with everything else. It was just kind of there. And then later, when I started playing the game with Chris, because we went to high school together in Illinois, um, found that. Wow, this is kind of a whole world unto itself, you know. This is different than all the Stephen King books my relatives keep buying me. This is like a different style, and um, I wanted to know more about it. So, you know, we were both fans from teenager, teenager times on. And we, you know, Chris and I lived in Los Angeles together for 15 years or however long yeah. it was, and, and worked on various projects. A lot of those were, you know, prior to doing the podcast. They always had some monster in them or some Lovecraft-influenced idea in there. So we were already on that path somewhat. Awesome. Yeah. Um, w one thing I like about uh, I liked about the podcast when you guys started was right off the top you talked about uh, Lovecraft's racism. I think it was Chris who was like, "Lovecraft is a racist." We're, we're let's get 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 the data out of the way. Um, how do you? This is it's coming up a lot in a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, maybe it's the time and place, maybe it's the climate that's out there right now, uh, but yeah. it's certainly. Um, yeah, it's rearing its head, I guess you could say. 
So how do you guys resolve that fact? I mean, it's, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I, I, I've been asking everybody this question. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with the fact that he was, I don't know, a fervent racist or <laughs> how would you describe it? It's a tough question, I'm, I know, but... I mean, not for me. I think for some people, it's for me, I, I, I think that there's that inherent contradiction in so many public figures and uh, historical figures that we have to deal with constantly. And yeah, we're seeing it in culture right now and in a big respect, people pulling down these Confederate monuments and then saying, how far does this slope go? Are we going to start you know, taking uh, the forefathers off of things because they were slave owners, etc.? So it's a question that we have to wrestle with in a number of different areas. But yeah, it's tough sometimes to go, yeah, we do this show about this guy, and people are like, oh, wasn't he a racist? It's like, hold on. <laughs> right. I, that, those were his privately held views. They do seep through into his fiction, but I wouldn't say that his fiction is a call to arms against uh, minorities or anything like that. So most of my time reading H.P. Lovecraft, I had no idea he held those personal opinions. Yeah, that wasn't so... something that, that came into play until I was basically told and pointed in the, in the right direction. That said, I don't think you should ever avoid it. I mean, I'm a student of American literature, and to me, the question of race has been imbued in every text I've discussed since I was in college on. I mean, you, you don't talk about American literature unless you talk about race. So I have no, there's nothing about it that scares me. I want to get into that discussion. I think it's good. Um, I don't think you need to throw away all the fiction because of his personally held views, though. I mean, it, there's nothing in reading it that contaminates me with that. So I don't really worry. I honestly don't worry about it that much. But I do understand there's a public view there. You know, I, I understand why they wanted to pull his image off the World Fantasy Award, for example. Those things don't really bother me. I know that some other folks have gotten kind of up in arms about it. Um, I want it to be an include. I mean, I think weird fiction is goes way beyond Lovecraft. And uh, even his contemporaries that were in the Lovecraft circle, you know, some of them were gay, of different ethnicities. I mean, like it or not, his personally held viewpoints didn't stop anybody from writing this kind of stuff. And so I, I don't know. I say let's address it and then let's see, are there ways that this stuff appeals to a larger community that we can look for? I mean, I don't know. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, you have to look at the, the whole of a person's uh, a life and what does Lovecraft actually offer and is attained by racism. You know, like there are certain people that just did horrible things uh, and there are other people that did some very important things. I mean, Thomas Jefferson did some really important stuff for our country, but he owned human beings. So do we throw away the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution because they were written? No, of course not, because those things work. And you have to you have to look at, I mean, like my grandmother was racist, and I, I still love her, and she was a great grandma to me, and she did all these amazing things. Her racism came up every once in a while, but I knew that it was wrong, and... I knew she was wrong in that aspect of it. So, uh, I mean, Barack Obama has a great speech about race, which totally nails this. It's like you can't throw away everything that a person did just because of some specific beliefs. And uh, Lovecraft offers, I mean, he was such a great uh, mentor to so many writers. I mean, he changed the face of, of horror fiction and, and writing for so many people, and that's why he's still around. It's because... Uh, not so much, I believe, because of his writing, but he was so loved and his style was so loved by by people that came after him that they uh, utilized his ideas and 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 um, and, and still think that the, the things that he did, the his type of writing, his weird fiction, his kind of nihilistic view, and uh, they, they think it's important. I think it's important. And you can't judge a, a whole person just by part of what it is that they were that's a great that's uh that's great um yeah it's interesting because dealing as you guys may or may not know we've been working on a uh a film about robert m price a documentary yeah and um uh, i i just did a little vlog about it but um we had to stop and start so many times because so many different things were going on in his life so uh immediately after we finished post-production um, he did that thing at uh, Necronomicon in Providence, and people right, yeah. we, were, we were there for that. People started emailing us saying, "How could you guys support this guy? And how could you make a documentary about him?" And so on and so forth. Um, and then the U.S. election came, and his opinions started cropping up in the Facebook feed, <laughs> and people were like, "Absolutely!" Like there was like a yes or no answer, and. You know, the time I spent with him, we brought him up here for about three days. He's an absolutely lovely person. He was completely yeah. engaging. He's very, very funny. But he'll say, you know, he, he said what he said, but then he'll go on his podcast and he'll say it's absolutely unacceptable that people would hold these views. 
like, you know, denouncing Lovecraft's racism, denouncing uh, racism in general, but then, I don't know, somewhere in his mind he, he resolves to hold those views, you know what I mean? So it's, it's uh, I don't know what way, it's funny, but I went to the um, Del Toro's uh, show at the AGO here in Toronto, it just opened last week at Home with Monsters. Oh, and there's yeah, a, it great. it's it's great, eh? And there's a there's a room with uh, Lovecraft and uh, all Lovecraft influences and and the uh, the people that he influenced. And um, I'm eavesdropping on on conversations, and people are like, "Why would he have? And why would he have an image of this man? Why would he make a sculpture of this man?" And somebody said, "Well, the exhibit's called At Home with Monsters." And I guess they were suggesting that that Lovecraft was some kind of monster in the same vein as Frankenstein or any of the other ones. So I don't know. It's just like, yes, I I, I understand. It's just, it's so funny how, um, how prevalent it was. I went through most of my life reading Lovecraft and it came up, obviously, when I first discovered it, I was, I I hate to say, I won't tell you how old I was because it's, uh, I was incredibly naive at the time, but I was in New York. And uh, I, w- I was there for business. And I w- one night I went to the bar. I uh, was at the Ritz. And I was, went to the bar. And I was looking out at the Statue of Liberty. And I was thinking to myself, you know, my grandfather was an Italian immigrant. And I'm looking out at the statue. And I'm thinking, wow, he would be so proud. You know, he came over here when he was 14 years old, like in the 20, 30, I forget the date what it was. And, you know, he lied about his age. He went through all this hardship to start a new life for, for his, his family. And I thought, well, while I'm in New York City, I think I'm going to read some of the uh, Lovecraft's New York fiction. And I, had, <laughs> I, I hadn't read horror at Red Hook at that time. And I read it and I was just like, like, that one is bad. I, yeah. you know, I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> he would, you know, he's describing essentially the, the time zone is wrong, but he's describing my grandfather, essentially. And uh, yeah. that was a that was a, a rough moment, but um, you know it's uh, it's funny. I think it's it's great that we uh, we have to resolve these things for ourselves. You know. Yeah. Well, look. I mean, I th- I think that if he wasn't fundamentally flawed, then we might not have gotten some of the xenophobic. Fi- I mean, some of his like fear of the other is what translated in them to writing these great things about fishmen and stuff like that. So whatever personal shit needed to be broken in his mind for him to do that, I'm kind of okay with it because it's not like he was out. He didn't do anything violent. He wasn't. Nobody knew he held these views other than the people he corresponded with. So, had he, you know, physically been out there doing terrible things, that'd be a different story. But here, I think that he was a little nuts, and then it translated into this great fiction. And okay, you know. Um, another question I had for you guys was uh, how this is a, an, an, an odd one, but how fulfilling is this for you? Like, like. Um, you know, personally, I get a lot of. Uh, I, I think I've explained it before in some of the, in one of the blogs we did, but about um, you, you, when you're creative, you have to have a creative outlet, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, this is a you know great form of expression playing around in this mythos. What, for you guys doing the podcast, you're at like three hundred and how many episodes now? That's seventy something. Three seventy something. That's a long time. That's a yeah. lot of work. It's an incredible amount of work. I haven't even touched on doing that much, that much, investing this much time in it. Um, what do you get from it? How fulfilling is it? Well, well, obviously, it's. I mean, it's fulfilling because we, we're still doing it after all this time, and and we've got um, we've got subscribers, and so financially, we're able to. It it supports us as a as part of our income. So. It's, it's been a steady income for me for when I made the transition from moving over to the UK to here. It's, it's something that I've had. Uh, it's not quite, not, not quite enough to live off on, but it, it definitely supplements my freelance lifestyle that I have. And um, that's been really important. So it, when the times that I just don't want to read another uh, MR James story, <laughs> yeah. that I go, you got to do it. That's your job. Get, get to work knuckle down and do it and you do it but then there are other times that we get such great stuff like man i really love the white people that we just covered yeah i loved uh the poor farm story we're doing uh, werewolf of paris right now and it's it's a joy to be delving into these stories and really like because we do more than read them we have to research them we have to go over them over and over (laughs) again and write our notes for our show 
so I like I mean Chad has said before we're doing like you know uh, grad student type work here you know this is a, this is we're researching a, a, show, a production every week and it's a lot of effort but you get a lot out of it more so than you would ever get from just reading these stories yeah it's 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 uh, as Chris says it's fulfilling because we, we we make a little money from it it's my part time you know we're both freelance guys working out of the house and so it's it's great that we were able to build it into a little bit of an income, but also, um, and you know this from being a filmmaker, that these projects, artistic projects, often, especially making a film, take a long time. So long that you're usually sick of the thing you're doing by the time you're done with it, to be honest. And so it's like, having come from a background where we made a movie, it took eight years, you know, I'm working on something right now uh, that's been four years in the making, and I still don't know when it's going to start, right? So you got to keep creative, and for me, this is fulfilling just because every week we make something new you know and it tumbles together in all those odd ways i love that when we're editing like i'll put a piece of music in and it'll end just at the right place or something will happen in the universe you know it's i love all of the little creative goofy things that fall together or how like we'll pick a story randomly and it'll really connect to the one the week before i love all of those cool little synchronicities that pop up and stuff but it's really fulfilling just to whether you want to or as chris says sometimes i don't want to read these stories but um having that outlet every week is crucial if you're you know an artist and you're working on this stuff it's great and well, if it's bad you know what we're making another one the next week so there's also that <laughs> you don't need to let it down so it's like something comes out and i go uh yeah i don't know some of that stuff didn't land oh well it's done let's move on and that feels really good <laughs> yeah well i gotta say like i think it was uh episode three you guys did uh dagon and you mentioned uh elder sign and i yeah. i literally jumped like I was like, oh, like I was good. like, I, I, it's funny because you put this stuff out there and you don't think anything's going to happen. Yeah, and I yeah. was like, here I am listening to something that I really enjoy. And I hear you, I hear it being mentioned. I was just like, oh my God. Like it yeah, was, that's awesome. it's, 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 for me, that's why, why I keep doing it essentially. But, um, I just wanted to yeah, ask we because, get really, I mean, the people who listen to the show are amazing and we get such nice messages all the time from folks who are like, Hey, this is what I'm doing while I'm listening to your show. Or, you know, I was in the hospital yeah. for a while. It just got me through and you know, all that's great. Sometimes it's like, you guys are stupid and you need to stop doing this because everything you say is dumb. We get those, but you know, <laughs> for the most part, they're really positive and connected. Yeah, it's it's funny too when you said you listened to the third episode. I went back to try and listen to some of our old stuff, and I'm 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 so embarrassed by them now. But to me, they're just it's like uh, I, I keep thinking I I wish we could go back and redo those no. because we're we're much better than we used to no. be. I mean, just all I, of that stuff. But of course, you can't. No, it, what is? It is, is what it is. I don't I don't yeah. I don't totally agree with you guys because I got to be honest. Like when I first started listening to it. There was um, an element of uh, sincerity that uh, I hadn't found, I hadn't heard anywhere else, which is why I stuck with it. I think like, I mean, there was one point, Chad, where you were actually talking about your, your personal life and your dad and, uh, you know, the situation at home and how that affected you. Um, uh, Chris, you're, you know, talking about the move and your relationship and so on and so forth. And like, to me, that kind of human element or you know, revealing yourself that way. I think that's, that for me, that was huge because I listened to a lot of this stuff. I mean, you know, I listened to uh, Robert's podcast, for example. He never really, get, he's very academic. Um, he's obviously very opinionated, uh, but I, I never get a sense of, of, of who he is. And I know that sounds strange, but I don't. I, I think like five episodes in, I had a, a very good sense of, of who you guys were. So as I was listening to it, I'm thinking to myself, like, I want to hear more of your perspective. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, oh, it's kind of like a, um, uh, uh, who are the guys who used to do the two thumbs up, two thumbs down? Like, Siskel and Ebert. Cisco and Ebert. I felt it was kind of like, a, like. <laughs> Those guys are great. Yeah. No, Those but you know what great. I mean? Like, it was like, that was like a, a back and forth about stuff that I was really into and hearing the perspectives. Also, the sense of humor, too. I mean, as you know, we are very... We, we like to make light of, uh, of weird fiction and horror. Um, and I love yeah. the sense of humor. Like, some of the jokes are laugh-out-loud funny. Um, yeah. And I, like, I'm, I'm being totally sincere. Like, I find myself laughing a lot. And especially when you don't like something, there was the... Uh, <laughs> what was it called? Um, the... Mo- oh, I forget which one it was. It wasn't a Lovecraft story. It was about... Um, uh, a monster who's in a chair. What the hell was that one? Do you know what I'm talking about? 
I forget what it, what it no, was. Love and, it sounds great. Uh, you guys just <laughs> ripped it, and I, we, like it started bad and it got worse, and, and that was hilarious. And I just thought that like, so I, you know. Well, it's important for us to be. I mean, like we're not experts. We're not intellectuals. I don't mean you know, really. So. Part of that, like just being vulnerable, is also just saying, "Look, this is my point of view. You might feel entirely different about this, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to talk about it the way we talk about the stuff with our friends, not the way you might in a classroom." Right. You know, yeah. this is like I, this struck me as funny. I know it was supposed to be horrifying, but I thought it was preposterous. You know, doesn't mean, but that's just, I'm just a guy talking about it. I'm not, you know, a professor. So I think part of that is just our tone. We tried to set early on is. Um, you know, we're not being very dogmatic about this. This is just how we're receiving the, the material. No, well, I, and since Chad and I now live so far away from each other, this is something we do every week together, and this is kind of our time to hang out. So, yeah. like, it, it, there's a, there is a level of, of sincerity to this. I mean, we're, we're really, honestly, just hanging out with each other, trying to make yeah. each other laugh, and, you know, talk about something that we think is cool. So, I wanted to ask you guys, who are your fans? Uh, like... I, I know that's it's it's hard to nail down, but I typically. I can list them for you. We got I got a list. Um, Subscriber list. No, but typically. Is that what you want? No, I'm saying like, you know, what's your uh, it, 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 to use an advertising term like what's your demographic? Who who is your average listener? Um, is it possible? It's so hard to tell because eighteen to twenty four year old girls, I believe. <laughs> We do have a fair amount of teenagers. I mean, it's hard to get a picture of it because we don't have that breakdown in our numbers. I mean, so it's like, it's always weird when we go to the Necronomicon Con or a convention like that to actually meet folks because to us, it's just, it feels very, you know, we're in a vacuum. We're just doing this. And I, I know that people are listening to it because the numbers are there and they're writing in, but we don't have, you know, it's not like doing a stage show or something. But um, I don't know. I think there's precocious teenagers. There's definitely like older guys who've been reading this stuff since the 60s that are like, you know, kind of the old old guard, the old Robert Price's Crypt of Cthulhu generation, I think, is, is around there. Right. Um, you know, there's just, there's a healthy metal goth contingent who got into this stuff through that. Uh, I don't know. I feel All like over the place. There's a lot of artists who listen while they're working. So we, do, we definitely have a lot of like very creative painters and sculptors and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's a lot of sci-fi horror nerds in their 40s. It's a huge gaming, huge gaming nerd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that might be the fun. biggest segment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, what do you guys... That, I mean, that's what we are. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we're nerds in our 40s, and we're from that generation, so I think there's a lot of people that, right. that a lot of our fans are probably just like us. Um, what do you guys do uh, outside of the podcast? And the ter and podcraft, podcast? Um I, I mean I know, but if maybe if you wanna if you wanna talk about it a little bit, in terms of like, yeah, sure. professionally John, or I, even for expression I, or. I, I used to do film production, but I haven't really done much uh, since I've moved to Los or since I've moved away from Los Angeles to, to England. I've done a few short films with my friend Greg Johnson out here, yes. but that's not professional. That's purely just for fun. And uh, I've been doing some some writing work on the side. Uh, mostly for role playing games. That's kind of been my bread and butter lately, and I've done some comic book writing as well. Um, and that's I've all, done some education. Is uh, I've been teaching some kids how to do stop motion animation, but I haven't been doing that much recently. Uh, that kind of dried up, and I've been busy with this other stuff. And I'm also doing another podcast with my wife right now called Rachel Watches Star Trek, where I get my non geeky wife to watch Star Trek, the original series, and she is very funny and very Yorkshire, so it is uh, an interesting dynamic, and uh, um, people like it. Yeah, it's very funny. And uh, Quiet and Bold, what's what's that? Uh, could, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, again, another project I've been with Greg, and Chad's helped out on it, and, and his wife, Heather, and my wife, Rachel, and it's a kind of a, a send-up of those paranormal investigator characters that we've run into in a lot of these stories that we've covered, and... Uh, it's just a radio comedy. That's it, sort of thing. We're hoping to do a, an hour-long show, uh, probably. I wanted to say at the end of this year, but it looks like it's going to be the beginning of next year before we'll actually get to it. And Chad, I don't have anything specific to trumpet right now, but yeah, I still work. I still have to keep one foot in film, and um, you know, I'm working on various writing projects right now, but nothing. You know, I, I, I do the podcast, I do some marketing work to supplement my income, I, I still do some music work, so occasionally I'll do music for a game or for um, somebody else's podcast, I've been doing some of those lately. Um, you do I'm all the music on, for the show too, right? 
I'm sorry? You do all the music for the show as well? and. Yeah, I do the music for the show, and a lot of times those are uh, cast-off pieces that I did for other stuff. So, I, you know, it's a good lesson for anybody that, like, nothing is wasted. So I did a lot of music for different projects and films and commercials and things over the years that didn't get used, but I kept it. And then now when we do the show, something will come up that's perfect for it, and I have that music already. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but, yeah, I do some music work. I do a lot of writing work. My background is really as a writer, so I'm, I'm working on a film now. But, again, nothing that's coming out anytime soon. Yeah, make sure you go to Chad's Bandcamp page, Chad Pfeiffer, Bank, Bank, Bank. Yeah, we got some records there. Awesome. Uh, it's just great. I love his music. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of his stuff, and I always tell people that they need to listen to it. So listen to it. Oh, thanks, Chris. <laughs> That's great. Well, the music on the show is amazing. So I will definitely put a link to all this stuff on the. Uh, Agreed. Right. Thank um, you. Are, 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 you know, I was going to ask you guys: Are we going to look back and say we wasted our time on H.P. Lovecraft for? 20, 30 years of our lives, or... <laughs> no way! <laughs> can, can you talk to my wife about it. that? I still love it. Yeah, I think it's great. It, it, it's, since we haven't covered Lovecraft in so long, though, it's funny. It's since you're, oh, yeah, you're the Lovecraft guy. And it's like, yeah, honestly, I haven't really read any of those stories since, like, 2012, so there's stuff I've forgotten, and, like, I don't remember. You know, we're focused on this other stuff here. Oh, dude, yeah. You know? and, and it's tough because people will ask me Lovecraft things, like I'm an expert on Lovecraft. Mm. And they'll go, oh, yeah, remember that story? And I was like... No, there's like it's a Lovecraft story. It's one of the like what, what happens in it again? Yeah. Oh right, yeah. Okay, yeah. I remember that one now, sort of. But no way, man. I you know I grew up loving science fiction and horror. I never stopped. I love reading. I love that this makes me read more every week. Uh, I have a great time talking to Chris. This isn't a waste of time at all. In fact, I'm really glad we're doing it because I have wasted my time on a lot of projects. This is one of the first where I really feel like I haven't. <laughs> you know. Yep. I mean, it's years of like a document of uh, this this relationship and of this literature, and I, I think that even though a lot of we try not to be too topical on it, but we are sometimes. Regardless, I think that you could listen to it in ten years and still be entertained. You know. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely the people that I've turned on to the uh, to the podcast are um, they're slowly going through all of it, and uh, it's amazing. Like, there's no time. It's a. It, 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 it's it's timeless in a way like you know people asking me well how, how did they get to 375 or 378 and do i have to go all the way back to the beginning and, um and uh, like it just explaining the premise um it's amazing how many people opt in right away but uh yeah. it's uh I, I think you guys are doing an amazing job and um oh, thanks. and thanks. uh it's i i listen frequently and uh, cool. you know, I just think it's uh, it, it's great that you guys are doing this, and um, I hope you keep it up. And I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to talk about, or no, well, I just want to make sure that you're still going to be doing some stuff. That you're oh yeah, done making Lovecraft movies. Yeah, we uh, not even we're not even close to being done. We've got two things yeah. coming up, and uh, we're actually doing a uh, a feature in um, cool. March. April. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yes. It's a uh, rough, uh, uh, loosely tied to the festival and um, it's kind of like a retelling of the festival and we've been working on a lot like, you know, we, I, I don't know if you guys know, but we started this thing called Black Goat, which was um, mm -hmm. kind of our departure from comedy. But the problem was people watched and they didn't, it's not what they expected from us. So the, uh, yeah, the yeah. festival will be, there's a lot of kind of it's a lot of dark humor it's it's tragically funny um but uh we're gonna we're doing our best to uh, to nail the the um the atmosphere for sure and uh yeah so i think we're ready to go probably we're ready to go in april and it's seasonal too so it's gonna be it won't be the yuletide but it will be like uh shortly uh shortly after so um yeah we're excited and uh, cool, there's a couple of other shirts we've got on, on the uh, on the way as well. So oh, that's great. Yeah, good times. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for for uh, for talking, guys, and I really appreciate it. If you're ever in Toronto or Canada, just uh, come by. Yeah. And it's funny. Yeah, I, I happen to keep meeting people from Toronto for some reason. So if I actually end up going to Toronto, there's there's a handful of folks I can go see. It's crazy. Yeah, but you should pronounce that second T, though, right? It's Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, thank, thank you. you. How do we end this?